Good morning, everyone. We will go ahead and get started. This is History's Lunch in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium. Thank you all for coming. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. And uh, a couple of reminders for any of you who are newcomers to the series. We have an email list that we maintain. You can sign up over there by the cookies and coffee, and we'll send you an email each week about the uh, the program and then one about the next program coming up. And next to that are membership brochures for the two museums. Uh, if you have not gotten a chance to go through the museums yet, they really are stunning and I hope that you can do that soon. The membership allows you unlimited access to the museums. Pick these up and learn more about that program. And then I hope that you will all be able to join us next week with uh, when multi-instrumentalist Tim Avalon will be our guest speaker. He'll be accompanied by guitarist Susan Farley, and they will present the differences between old-time music and bluegrass, and they will play the differences between old-time music and bluegrass. It'll be a lot of fun. That program is co-sponsored by the Mississippi Historical Society. Today, we are delighted to have Ellen B. Meacham with us to discuss her new University Press of Mississippi book, Delta Epiphany, Robert F. Kennedy in Mississippi. Ellen Meacham has been a journalist for more than 20 years. She was a reporter in North Mississippi and at the Charleston, South Carolina Post and Courier, and her work has appeared in the New York Times and many other places. In 2005, Meacham was named an American Press Institute Fellow and served her fellowship at the Baton Rouge Advocate. Currently, she teaches journalism at the University of Mississippi. Help me welcome Ellen Meacham. Thank you, Chris. I'm so glad to be here. And it's very, as someone who teaches college students and has for quite a while, it is so nice to see a whole group of people who want to be here um, and aren't just buried in their phones. And um, so it's, I'm very happy about talking to y'all today. Um, and I'm so thankful to uh, the Department of Archives and History and the museums here. So what, a, what a beautiful facility. Um, so as I talk, some of the photos from the book and a few points um, with numbers and data and stuff are going to kind of just play behind me. Um, and I really wanted to make sure that you got a chance to see some of the photos in the book because I was really proud of that. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, so as some of you may know, my book, Delta Epiphany, uh, covers the um, visit by Robert Kennedy in 1967 to Mississippi. And um, he was here as part of a Senate subcommittee hearing. He was only here for about 48 hours. In my book, I really wanted to focus on that sort of discrete time period, a little more than 48 hours. Um, and, but there was so much that was happening at that time that it was, um, uh, I thought, a great jumping off place for a lot of different um, uh, ways to examine and look at some of the changes that were happening in Mississippi. And um, because I uh, live right outside Oxford, I feel like I'm required to quote Faulkner. I think it's in my contract. But um, I got the idea for the book for, from a colleague of mine, Curtis Wilkie, and some of you may know him. He's a Mississippi native. He was a longtime reporter for the Boston Globe, but he started his career in Clarksdale as a reporter um, in 1962. And so he was there when so many things were happening and um, changes were happening in the Delta and in Mississippi uh, related to civil rights. And he wrote a memoir just as I was moving out of graduate school and starting to teach and really missing the newsroom and missing reporting. He, he had a memoir about his time as a reporter in, Missis in Mississippi in the South and then later for the Boston Globe. 
And there was this one page of description of being in this cabin with Robert Kennedy while he um, knelt on the floor trying to get this response out of this child. And um, it was such a vivid kind of image. And Faulkner says that for him, a story started with an image or a memory, a strong image or a memory. It always started with that. And that's what, how this story sort of started for me because I was very interested in the juxtaposition of this um, sort of son of power and privilege and America's um, promise. And the Kennedys always have that kind of shiny look in pictures. They had this. And I had been a reporter in North Mississippi. And I knew, even though it was many years later, I knew what some of those places were like. And so um, just the image of him in that place uh, made me curious. And so I wondered, first of all, how did it affect Kennedy when he came? Because I knew, I kind of knew on the periphery of my imagination and my knowledge of history, I, I knew about him coming to Mississippi. It was kind of this iconic touchstone that every now and then some politician would mention or would come up in a news story about Robert Kennedy. So I was wondering, especially about the impact that it had on him in and, and Mississippi. But then the very next question I had was, what happened to the child? What happened to that baby? Um, because we know, sadly, what happened to Robert Kennedy. We knew the rest of that story, even if we didn't know the depth of how this um, visit impacted him. But what happened to the child? So I sort of assigned myself homework for about the next 10 years of <laughs> um, trying to find, the, seven years, it took me seven years, trying to find the child. Um, and the more I looked into it, the more I realized that um, this this visit was a um, a kind of it, it became a touchstone, but it was kind of a pivotal point in both his growth and a, a time when Mississippi a lot of tectonic plates were shifting in Mississippi and start were starting to have the tremors of a lot of change in the state. And so I thought if I could find that child or the children, um, that that I might be able to talk about what happened in the Delta too, uh, to the Delta too. Um, I also realized very quickly, I looked at Robert Kennedy, the first started studying Robert Kennedy, and he had said um, on the day he came back from his visit, the night he had told his children, and his children remembered, even after they were long grown, he had come into the room and said, um, and just stopped on the threshold and was deeply shaken. And then later, I was lucky enough to get to interview um, Mrs. Kennedy. And she said, you know, it was so strikingly different from the way he usually came home from a trip. Um, and he, they had actually let the children stay up late because it was her birthday. Um, and he got in about eight, 8 in Washington and got home a little after that, about 9. And but he was um, shaken and pale, and he just stopped and looked at his well-fed children all around that fancy table and, you know, said, I've just been to Mississippi, and families um, live uh, in, whole families live in rooms the size of this dining room. And the children don't have enough to eat, and you can see on their bodies the evidence of that, where you can see sores and um uh, their distended stomachs, and um, you, you just have to do something for your country. Do something. When you grow up, you must do something for your country. And so I knew that that was an impact. The next day, he told one of his aides, the wives of one of his aides, and this is kind of where I got the title, he said, you don't know what I've seen. You don't know what I've seen. Everything I've done to this point has been worthless. And I thought, whoa, that is a really... That's a powerful statement. If you think about where he had been, he had been, um, been after, he, he had tried to um, prosecute the uh, organized crime and the team in, within the Teamsters and gone after Jim, Jimmy Hoffa and um, had been attorney general and his um, brother had been assassinated. And I thought, and I knew enough about Kennedy to know that he wasn't, he wasn't a, I mean, he was a 20th century sort of male. He wasn't a real gushy kind of guy. You know, he wasn't someone who just um, made statements like that on a re regular basis. And he wasn't much of a self-pitying kind of kind of guy either, at least not, you know, publicly. And so 
so I started to think, wow, what did he see in Mississippi that made such an impact? Um, the next thing I realized was that um, the story that had been told about Robert Kennedy uh, was missing a really essential part of it. It was only half the story because the way it had been presented was that Kennedy, here comes the saint into this dark place, and, and not, not because he cast himself that way, but just because it had been boiled down. And the people that he met and encountered had become kind of like a backdrop, like the poverty set, like, and they were stock characters in a morality play. They were sort of faceless, nameless. Um, occasionally they might mention a name in one or two places, but it was just Robert Kennedy went to Mississippi and saw these faceless, nameless poor people. And so I became very, very committed. I didn't feel like I could write, could write the book unless I was able to bring those people into the light. And as I, the more I reported on them and, um, the African-American families, the more I realized that their stories were, in a sense, as heroic or more heroic than what he did when he came here, because they were living this and persevering and overcoming amazing obstacles and trying to find ways to feed their children and raise their children and care for their families and survive in a, a deeply oppressive and um, changing world, a world that was changing very fast and that they had not been prepared for. Um, so, so, so I ended up finding a, um, four different people who were, I say children, but they're grown, they're older than I am now, but um, uh, the, the four different people who encountered Kennedy or Kennedy encountered on the way, and one in um, outside of Clarksdale at the Delta uh, at this place called Freedom Village, which was an effort of the Delta Ministry and some other groups to try to find something for displaced farm workers to work on. And that's where the cover from the book is. is this is where he is outside of Greenville in rural Washington County, standing um, at the edge of the porch where he was talking to some of those families about how did they feed, why did they leave <clears throat> the farm, the plantation where they were working, and how did they feed their children, and what kinds of food was available to them, and what programs. Um, but I also found um, a nine-year-old boy, Charlie Dillard, um, who I'll, next time he pops up, I'll show you. He, he Mr. Um, Mr. Dillard was um, nine years old and remembered vividly his um, Kennedy coming to his house and talking to his grandmother. And then I found, so I found Catherine Wilson out at Freedom Village. She was 17, so she had she had had a different experience than nine-year-old Charlie. Then I found Brenda Luckett, who's um, and I was so glad I found her because she was from Clarksdale. That's Catherine there with her arms folded. Um, and uh, this is Charlie, the one that you can only see the half of him, and he's leaning against the wall. Um, so Brenda's parents were part of the tiny African-American middle class in Clarksdale. And so they, her father worked for the railroad. Her mother was a teacher. Um, she was, they, they were able to travel a lot and go, go to um, uh, Washington and New York and be in Chicago and be exposed to a lot of other things. And she was an only child, and her mother and father took her to everything. And they were very active in the civil rights movement. So she was a great eyewitness to that. She was nine, eight when um, Kennedy came through. But the one that was missing was that baby on the floor. I was still looking for, and I still didn't feel like I had a book until I found him because that would be the question everyone would ask. Um, was the baby that he met in Cleveland. And um, so it, uh, after about seven years of working on and off um, on it, I can't say that I was working every minute of seven years on it, but working on and off on it, um, I had a break and I found the White family, um, Miss Annie White's children, and um, David White, finally after me talking to different people and making phone calls, I finally had a phone call conversation with David White, who was the child on the floor that Kennedy was, he was about 18 months old. Of course, that's him now. Of course, he didn't remember it because he was a baby. His older brothers and sisters did, and they were wonderful to sort of share their stories and tell their stories about their mother. And um, 
and how what daily life was like there in that you know everybody just says a shack in Mississippi but I really wanted to take and, and Edna White um, Brisby was so generous to just sit with me for a couple of hours and tell me what it was like when their mother like how did their mother wash clothes because that's what she did she was doing when Kenny came in she was rubbing clothes on a washboard but I didn't I wanted to know like what's the process of that what did she have to do to get the water because they only had one spigot and to heat it up and to 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 wash it by hand and hanging out and um but so anyway so then I felt like okay now I've got a book and now I got to get busy to write it because I could report all day long and with no one giving me a deadline at this point I didn't have any kind of contract with Mississippi University Press you know I could it just I realized at some point that it was kind of becoming a hobby you know, and I was just going to be like the world's living expert on, greatest living expert on Bobby Kennedy coming to Mississippi and no one would ever know, you know. Um, so I had to to sort of get get myself going to actually write the book. Um, so, uh, so then I started looking at the context of the times too. And I mentioned those tectonic shifts that were, the, the, the tremors were just kind of starting. And so what are the first things I had done was go through every newspaper from every little town, big, little, every newspaper that covered the event and cover, was happening at that particular, those particular days and the month leading up and the month afterwards. And by looking at the front pages and looking at the other things, um, I realized, surrounding I realized, I realized that um, when Kennedy arrived, uh, the day before he went to Greenville, um, Clark Reed, who was a businessman in Greenville and, and kind of the architect of the Republican Party in Mississippi and in many ways in the South, the rise of it, but he lived in Greenville and he had, was hosting Maureen Reagan, who was the daughter of this new conservative governor of um, California, Ronald Reagan, and he was hosting her a, a, a he wasn't interested in Kennedy coming to Mississippi the next day because he was busy hosting a luncheon for um, women who might want to join the conservative women's um, group that Phyllis Shafley was running for. Uh, so here's Maureen. Here were stories right there beside Kennedy's coming tomorrow. Maureen Reagan's here today. Um, and then at the same time as Kennedy left Jackson, he spoke... Um, kind of an impromptu speech at Tougaloo on the 10th of April um, at Tougaloo College. And he, um, the next night, Stokely Carmichael, who was just the new head of SNCC and had um, sort of coined the phrase and was using the phrase black power and was shifting part of the shift of the civil rights movement into um, and sort of new frontiers, and he had some were, and he was, you know, both of them were welcomed quite enthusiastically, you know, to the same pulpit one night before, even though they were had a very different kind of um, approach. And so he had a few comments to say about Bobby Kennedy, and um, and uh, was not a fan, you know. Clearly, as I, as many of the civil rights leaders, that's the other thing that made it interesting is that. In this 40, I'm not good at math, so it was more than 48 hours, but it wasn't that many more. Um, in these two, basically two full days in Mississippi, he was met at the airport in Jackson by protesters that law enforcement said were connected to the KKK. They're passing out leaflets predict, predicting his death, um, according to the news articles. Uh, and the newspapers run by the white power structure were having a fit that he was coming and had all kinds of horror things to say about how dare he come back you know to Mississippi and um, they you know really opposed him and, and had a lot of deep animosity towards him and then within a certain segment of the white population of Mississippi many of the leaders of Mississippi um, but that Mississippi is not monolithic, as you know, and that's one of the things that made it so interesting to me because the more I looked at it, he was met by the Klan, and by the time he was leaving 48 hours later in Clarksdale, he was on a car, and Bill Miner, the a longtime Mississippi reporter, he was say he was said they were uh, there were a thousand people around him in Clarksdale, mostly African American, but some white, trying to just touch him. 
like and and Bill Miner said like he was Jesus or something um so I thought, wow, that is that is a really pol- you know polarized kind of idea. And then I saw that he had spoken, um, gave an impromptu speech at Millsaps. One of the sophomore class presidents just went up to the hotel the night they arrived and waited in the lobby and asked his aide if he'd come and give a speech at Millsaps. He said yes. And then the student had to call the president of Millsaps, Dr. Graves, and say, uh. Bobby Kenny said he'd give a speech. Can can you know? Can we get the auditorium? And so, um, and there, and if you'll see, there is a picture of that in the book too. Um, Kennedy, there was a huge crowd there, and he was enthusiastically wel- welcomed by mostly white young people in Jackson, Mississippi, at Millsaps. Uh, so, so it wasn't all the uh, no, every every white didn't. White person didn't love, Bo- uh, hate Bobby Kennedy in Mississippi, and um, as we will see, every African American didn't love Bobby Kennedy in Mississippi because people like Marion Wright, she had no interest in Bobby Kennedy when he came. He sent his aides down, and because he, she did felt like they had not done feel, fulfilled their promise um, in the Kennedy administration. And a lot of this, the people who are on the front lines of the civil rights movement really felt quite abandoned by the Justice Department when Kennedy was, um, and, and felt like they went, they accommodated the Southern lawmakers too much. They went too slow. They just um, left people, um, <coughs> you know, vulnerable. And so, uh, so that to me, that whole mix just made it such an interesting thing to explore and to try to kind of tease out and 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 see because we know what happened but at that moment so I really try to stay in the moment as I was writing it and write it kind of do as much of putting the reader into the moment as I could so I went to all the places and I looked every place that I could find that looked still looked the same so I could describe I drove the route on the very day in April that they went um, through a went uh, to look so I could and I would always ask the people I interviewed they would I would tell them at the beginning look I may ask you some weird questions but it's so I can put the reader in the moment so I'm gonna I may ask you what you had for breakfast that morning I may ask you what your color of your car was I may ask you what you were wearing that day or what um what so so any kind of sight sense memory and Oftentimes people would say, I don't know anything. It was just a moment. It was just a blip. I don't really, I can't really tell you anything. Everybody always says that. And then you start saying, you say, close your eyes. What do you, when you remember it, what do you see? And, and then they would talk for two hours, you know, <laughs> um, and, and, and bring up all kinds of things they'd never. Mrs. Kennedy, I just happened to notice that it was her birthday when I was doing research before I interviewed her. And so when she said, oh, it was, you know, it was, it was important, but it was so, so brief. And so I said, um, now it was your birthday. And she said, oh, you're right. That's right. It was my birthday. And the kids stayed up late. And so then all of this stuff started coming out from that moment that just, as you know, as we get older, sometimes you have to really push the right button for the file to come to the, to the forefront. And so I was lucky enough to do that. But... Um, Kennedy was not prepared. So he came to Mississippi as part of the Senate subcommittee. Marion Wright, there she is. Um, that was good timing. Doesn't she look impossibly young? She's 27 years old. She was a lawyer. <coughs> and she turned out, excuse me, uh, she turned out to be one of the heroines of the book, really, almost like the secondary char- main character. And I hope my voice holds out. So. She went to Washington to defend Head Start because they were holding their first of a series of hearings there uh, about some programs that were up for renewal or for changes after two and a half years in the war on poverty. And she um, talked about Head Start, but then she went off topic and said, look, people are worse off in the Delta than they were before all of this, in some ways, before all of these things were passed. It, it was good, it, you know, some of the programs were good for, for the nation, but because of the current situation in the Mississippi Delta, it's been a disaster. There's this unfolding catastrophe that no one is talking about. She didn't put it quite in those ways. She just looked and said, people are hungry, 
and they can't get food for the winter. They are begging, and someone needs to do something about it. She said, they're worse off. And there was a combination of pro things that the war on poverty, it wasn't, that wasn't the only reason people were, were worse off than they had been. People had always been poor um, uh, in the Delta, the majority of the population, mostly African American. Um, and so the problem was that people had kind of settled, once the sharecropping system was diminishing, they had settled into sort of a rhythm of, they would work during the season, the whole families might work um, at different times, work during the season for some for day labor cash, $3 a day or $4. I mean, I talked to one farmer who paid $6 a, a day, but they were paid by the day, um, sometimes long days during harvest or during um, other parts of the season. And then during the winter, they would get commodities from the government, which were surplus whatever was surplus, beans, um, might be a lot of grains. And so they kind of had figured out a way to get by with that. But um, they did away, many, they gave the counties a, cho a choice and many of the counties did away with the commodity D program with the war on poverty changes and adopted the food stamps, which in theory was good because it gave people a lot more choice over their, their diet and they could buy things they, they got to, they weren't just taking what, whatever they, was left over. They might be able to buy fresh fruits and vegetables or meat depending on how they spread it out. But they had to purchase those uh, for um, certain cents on the dollar. And I think it was like 10, 10 cents on the dollar. They had to buy those and then all of the jobs dried up. They passed the farm workers minimum wage, which meant you had to pay a dollar an hour, which also, worked in other parts of the country, but in the Delta, there was this crucial time where mechanization, the, 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 the tractors and those big combines, the price was coming down to the point that once you added that minimum wage in there for, so, so where you might be paying $3 a day for a 14 hour day, suddenly you'd be paying $14 a day for, so, so a lot of the farmers decided, well, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna buy a combine. And so um, 24,000 people directly were in an 18-month period were out of work. And 50, I think it's 54,000 if you add in the family members who often worked, like the children and the um, elderly and the other folks who worked with them. And so you had this population the size of Tupelo or something um, com with no skills because the um, the state of Mississippi had not invested, has never invested in trying to educate all of its children and invested what's needed and had no, had definitely um, had not spent any money on educating um, African American children. And you'll see there's a statistic there that was stunning to me about 1960 and how many people had, uh, that'll come up soon, how many people had a um, less than a fourth grade education and no, or no education at all. Um, so they really were practically starving. They just had, had to get by, they, they, and nobody was doing anything about it or talking about what needed to be done about it. Um, I think they were just hoping or even, you know, I never found any evidence that it was calculated. I could never find any paper trail that it was calculated to drive people out of Mississippi, African Americans out of Mississippi, but it's very um, interesting that this all came about right at the same time that the Voting Rights Act had, ha had been passed in 65, and African -Amer um, Americans were now going to be part of the electorate, and those people in power were going to have to a answer to them as well as to only the whites only that they had been answering for so long. Um, so as you can see, there were lots of things going on on the ground, but Kennedy was not prepared. He was here as an inspector general, as what Daniel Shore called him. Uh, he wasn't here as a poverty tour that um, we think of today where someone famous, and this is not a bad thing, where someone famous will go off to, um, so, or go someplace where people are in trouble and they'll use their celebrity to bring attention to an issue. But that's not what he was doing here. That's kind of what I thought he was doing. 
But he actually asked the cameras to stay out of the people's home because he felt like that was not respectful. After the first photograph, there's a couple of AP photographs, but after that he asked them to stay out of, especially the, tele, the television cameras, stay out of people's homes. Um, and they went to a lot of job training programs, and he was quite annoyed in Greenville when an official couldn't tell him how many people had actually gotten jobs through the job training program, how many jobs they were, what they were be training for. Um, and he was quite annoyed at this. He asked a lot of questions. The other two things that surprised me was that he... Um, he made unscheduled stops. He did not want to just see what the advocates wanted him to see. He wanted to, st he would say, let's stop here. If he passed a place that looked like he wanted to find out, let's stop here and talk to these folks. Um, and he asked journalists like Bill Miner, he took them aside and said, okay, who can I trust here? Who, who in the, here can I trust to tell me the truth? Which one of these advocates or these civil rights leaders you know, and um, as one of his aides told me, I probably shouldn't have been surprised because he was a rich man's son, and he all of his life he had had people wanting to kind of lead him around and sh manipulate him into seeing what he saw. He was also a prosecutor um, and investigator, and so he in in a courtroom kind of setting. And as you know, if you're a good law lawyer, you always try to see the whole picture. You never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. Um, and you haven't got it verified. So, um, so that was so. And, and then it, Daniel Shore, who was a CBS reporter, it, when I watched the clip, the video of his news report from that night, he said, with the demeanor of an inspector general, Kennedy went to unscheduled stuff. And I, I realized, you know, this is not like Princess Diana going to the landmines kind of thing. This is somebody who was taking his role as a senator seriously. He was interested, but he was not prepared what he foresaw, saw the children. He was not prepared for that. And he uh, had, a, even his enemies said he had a special connection with children. He had 10 of his own when he went and 11 eventually. Um, and as his um, widow told me, uh, he, because he was seven of nine children, he had so all those children. He was very, um, he was more comfortable around children than adults in a lot of ways. And he, um, he knew their developmental milestones, is what we call them today. And so he knew when he saw these children, he had children that same age, and he knew that they weren't getting what they needed, um, and he knew that there could be long-term consequences for this. And, and so he had this great sense of urgency. Um, but he was, it was a, it, so he was an interesting character to write about too because if you're writing a novel or a screenplay or any of those things you want a character that grows and doesn't just shift like it, nobody believes like oh he was this way today and then all of a sudden he was there and so even though I called it Delta Epiphany it was just it was a moment that hit him in the middle of a, a really sort of fertile growth period of his own he was coming out of the shadow of his brother his father had had a stroke he had moved from the executive branch to the legislative branch and was getting interested in poverty. And, but he just couldn't shake what he saw in Mississippi. He couldn't shake it. And there was another, another incident that I'm going to read here, and then we'll take some questions, that I think um, brought it home to him pretty clearly, and that was Marian, something Marion Wright. After this first picture, he asked them to stay out so they didn't go into it. Okay, to set this up, Marion Wright, the next month, after going to Washington, the next month they decided to hold their first outside Washington hearing in Jackson. And so Kennedy sent Peter Edelman down, his aide, one of his main aides, down to do the advance work. And she said, I'm sorry, I'm writing a brief. I don't have time for you. And he said, Okay, and she said, she, she wrote later that she thought he would just be another cigar chomping arrogant guy just like Kennedy she had a very bad impression of Kennedy as just kind of the swagger that liked to play both ends and a real political animal and so she was deeply skeptical of their interest in poverty or what they were doing down there uh, he wasn't running for president by this time even though the press was always saying that he was he might at this point he really had no um, intentions to run uh, until 72 so 
Um, <clears throat> so they go to, Cle to Freedom Village outside Washington, and then they get ready to go to Cleveland, and this is where we'll pick up. <clears throat> and I hope my voice will get through. With a federal marshal at the wheel, Kennedy, Wright, and Edelman settled in for a 38-mile 30 mile drive to Cleveland, Mississippi. They had been riding together since the airport in Greenville, and Marion Wright found Kennedy, who rode in the front, to be a surprisingly pleasant companion. He was sort of relaxed. He was funny. He was honest, she would later recall. Kennedy teased her about having to open the door for her since she rode in the back of the marshal's car, which was used sometimes to transport prisoners. I'm the star, he would say, and you let me open the door for you? What would you do if I hadn't come? He joked. Always curious, Kennedy quizzed her about her life in Mississippi and what motivated her to work in such a troubled place. He asked what she was reading, and they discussed her selection, the confessions of Nat Turner, and moved on about to talk about how to encourage children to read. She was firm with her boundaries, though. When he turned his questions to her personal life, when was the last time she went to the movies? When had she gone, last gone on a date? She quickly told him that it was none of his business. <clears throat> Kennedy then shifted his attention to the attitudes of Mississippi people, black and white, toward the federal government. He also quizzed Wright about the ongoing shift in rhetoric toward black power, which SNCC advocates such as Stokely Carmichael had first embraced publicly just a year earlier, not too many miles from where she and Kennedy were sitting. They're reasonable enough. These questions touched a nerve in the young NAACP lawyer. Wright was not naive. She knew full well the political considerations that Kennedy had wrestled with as Attorney General the need to placate powerful Southerners in Congress, Cold War intrigue, the concerns about public opinion after a razor-thin victory in the 1960 election, and his role as his brother's protector, just to name a few. But Wright knew something else, something that was more powerful, more visceral, more painful than her intellectual, inter intellectual understanding of a complex political situation. Marion Wright knew the reality of Mississippi jails, secret trials, beatings, lynchings, snarling dogs loosed on children and old people, Medgar Evers on the highway, uh, Med I mean, sorry, Medgar Evers dying in front of his children from a sniper's shot, James Meredith writhing on the highway, Vernon Dahmer, the flames and smoke from a firebomb searing his last final, final gasps for breath. James Cheney, Mickey Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman, holes in their head buried under tons of Mississippi mud. To many of the people helping African Americans in Mississippi struggle to exercise their rights as ordinary citizens, the Kennedy Department of Justice had been, in fact, no such thing. The failures of the Kennedy administration's approach were clear to her from her first visit to the state as a young law student in 1961. The first night she was in Greenwood, someone burned down Snick's house. The next night, someone shot at another house where they were staying. The third night, she watched police beat people, th the third day, she watched police beat people young and old who were rallying for voting rights. Officers arrested them and locked her out of the courthouse and tried the protesters without a lawyer. Frantic, frightened, and outraged, she called the Justice, Justice Department attorney John Doerr just before the telephone lines going out of town were cut. I said, John, you really don't know what's going on here, and I described the whole scene, and John's first words, which in retrospect were right, were infuriating at the time. He said, stop being emotional and talk like a lawyer. All I could say was, what the hell are you going to do? I had never felt such a feeling of total isolation in my life, just total helplessness. I had told John what was going on. He was very calm, you know. We'll send somebody in to investigate, which is the word I got to hate most of all, she said. Wright knew that it was this kind of bitter disappointment that had fueled the anger and shift towards black power within the ranks of SNCC. So many of those workers, she said, were early in the movement, the most idealistic, the most trusting. They really believed they could change the world, she would later say. They had hoped in the problem promise of a Kennedy administration, which instead had left them too often at the mercy of their oppressors. 
It was spring in the fertile fields of the delta outside her car window, and in the fertile fields of the delta outside her car window, a cycle as old as time was beginning anew. This year, though, thousands of the people who'd worked so hard on the land with so little to show for it were not needed and had nowhere to turn. Oh, there was so much to say. In that moment, however, Wright instinctively drew upon a southern tradition. She was from South Carolina. One that ran deep in both the black and white communities of her native region. She told Robert Kennedy a story. Okay. And y'all... Uh, um, so, any questions? I'll be happy to take any questions that anybody has. Or... He's got the microphone, so. Um, I hope I can do this. My name is Genevieve Fine. Mm. And uh, we worked up in the Delta in those days yes. and saw everything that you're talking about. Um, it is my recollection, I wasn't there at the time, but that Bobby Kennedy went to Greenwood. Do you know anything about that? You know, I've heard a couple of people say that, but I, on this particular trip, all of the itineraries and news coverage, no one ever mentioned Greenwood. Um, and so I, I don't. I'm not sure if maybe Ted Kennedy went to Greenwood a little bit later, or if that was, I never found anything about, about it on this particular trip where I was trying to okay. um, focus on. They did send, now they did send right after his visit, they sent a, a team of doctors down and they went to Greenwood like a few weeks later, um, but well, I don't know. <clears throat> one of our uh, members in our Pax Christi group uh, named Joey Cammer, took him around to the, the little shacks out in the uh, mm -hmm. delta, the farms around Greenwood, where she always knew people. So uh, we can look back in our chronicles and see what we can find about Yeah, I'd that. love to know about that. I'd love to know yeah. more about that, because a few people have said yes, um, but I didn't find any anything about it. And I was really trying to keep the camera just on this I keep on him through this because it makes for more compelling reading when it's kind of a discreet kind of thing. So, um, uh, but as far as on, on this trip, I, I didn't see that he went to Greenwood. Yes, hi. hi. I, I'm from the Delta south of Greenville. I was wondering who determined the route that. Uh, That's a good question. Um, some of it, the initial flight, I believe, was determined by some of the. Um, the committee uh, aides that worked for Senator Joseph Clark, who was also on the trip with Kennedy and never gets mentioned, poor old Joseph Clark, um, was another senator from Pennsylvania who was with him in the Delta. There were four in Jackson and two went back. And, um, but so, so they were going, initially set it up just to fly over there and see some job training, some of those official federal programs. Um, but... Marion Wright told me that Amzie Moore, uh, who was, a, as you, I'm sure you know, civil rights, um, st I'm used to talking to 18-year-olds, so I always feel like I have to explain who everybody is, um, but uh, so that he had the idea to take, take him into the home, some of the homes of the poor on that trip in Cleveland, and, and they, they did, they went out to Freedom Village and made some other stops. Um, Ken Dean, I think, was also involved in, um, in some of the planning for that. But a lot of the homes he went into were unscheduled, too. Were just once he picked on the side of the road as they were driving by. So, I don't know. Yes, ma'am. What was Freedom Village about? I, I um, Freedom Village, it's called, I think, it was called, it, what really confused me, it took me a while to figure out, because it was called at some part, part of its time Freedom City, and then it was called Freedom Village um, later, and it was a part, the Delta Ministry was involved, which had a connection to the um, National Council of Churches and some other groups, uh, and it was one answer to this problem of what are we going to do with all of these folks who have been farm workers who are now displaced. And so it was kind of a cooperative farm where they were going to, they got some grants to build their own houses. They would own their own houses, but use the skills they had because not everybody wanted to leave. 
A lot of people, as we know, the Great Migration was continuing that time. Thousands of people left and went to the cities, went up north. But not everybody could or wanted to leave. And so Freedom Village was a, a place where they were, um, they had um, families about I don't know, maybe 30 at the, uh, I have to look back in the book. But, uh, and they were going to farm, take what they knew and farm the land. They had about 400 acres and build uh, homes and they had a Head Start program and, and a um, workshop where they made nativity scenes and some other things. But it, it sort of dwindled in the 70s. And so now it's out there um, and it's just, it's just fallen into to ruin, mostly. Yes, hi. Hello. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you so much for having the courage to write the book. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I've been black for a long time, and, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really anxious to know more and more about um, what has gone on. I was listening to, uh, L to MPB right. one day, and in Selma, Alabama, uh, yes. a mother wanted to register her daughter into an academy. Mm -hmm. She thought the letter that she received was about registering the child, her child attending the school. But she said when she got there in the auditorium, there was, uh, there was a group of in the auditorium and the principal mm -hmm. had a bullhorn horn and he screamed, you stole our inheritance. <gasps> what? I was totally baffled by yeah. that statement. So I asked a, a white minister and his question was, okay, what's the number one religion in Mississippi, in the South? And I said, Baptist. Mm -hmm. So then he said, that is what they were taught. Yeah. That because of slavery, the abolishment of slavery, yeah. we were supposed to be their inheritance. Oh, how and that's weird. how it was passed down. Yeah. So four hundred it's, it's yeah. only been hundred and fifty years right. since that period of time and Mississippi especially hasn't adjusted yet. No, they haven't. And don't no, plan no, on no. as a as a state. I, I I always like I said, Mississippi's not monolithic, but you're right. The the power some of the power structure definitely has it. And, and, and the retired senators fr from Tupelo basically said the same thing, mm. that uh, his, his grandmother, when her fields were burning, mm -hmm. his grandmother, he remember her saying that they were going to make life as difficult as possible, mm -hmm. as well as one of the governors of Mississippi said, they're gonna make life as difficult for the name mm -hmm. people as they could mm -hmm. in the state of Mississippi. So for anyone to think that we can change things and we're blamed for not being able to rise above right. what's happening to us, it's, it, and I, again, I thank you so much. Even though we're still trying, I thank you so much for writing the book. All right. Well, Mississippi, um, you know, I, during this process, like I said, it dawned on me that only half the story had been told. And one of the things that people ask me from outside of Mississippi, like, why do you stay in Mississippi? Why are you still in Mississippi? And um, I say, if you only look at the horrible things that have happened in Mississippi, you're still only looking at half of it. The The other half is, I know, you're, the other half is the beautiful courage and perseverance. And to me, Mississippi, if you look at people like Fannie Lou Hamer and Amzie Moore and people who risked their lives, and these people here who just were not famous but lived these lives of courage and perseverance and um, uh hard work and pain and um, it's in incredibly inspiring to me. So like that half of Mississippi history, uh, it's like the, the mirror image. It's like, so anytime you have oppression over here, you've got these people who, who were speaking out against it and risking their lives and get, becoming, you know, wanting voting rights. And to me, that is a fascinating story and an empowering and a beautiful story that um, I think is maybe I hope what they're trying to do some with the museum here, but um, so I, I think Mississippi is a is frustrating but also fascinating place to be, and, insp and it inspires me. You know, I look at those folks, and of course I'm uh, like you said, you've been black, I've been white all my life, but. To me, those, and especially women, these women, these mothers, I had a baby as I was doing, as I was writing this book, I didn't have, late in life, 
and you know, just the heartbreaking um, difficulty of having children and seeing their bodies grow and not being able to give them what they need. Just, just oh, it just ate at me and hurt so bad um, to be thinking about that. And I wanted to name like Mrs. Fam- Mrs. Family, Fanny Dillard and Annie White and these ladies, Ora D. Wilson, and these women who were relegated to often in the news um, coverage just called a Negro woman, like in the, Kennedy came in and talked to a, which is a term they used then, a Negro woman. And I wanted to name their names and have their pictures in there. And so, did you find much uh, com- public commentary about Stennis Eastland and whoever the governor was at that time? And is that in the book? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by. Um, about the trip, oh, they, the, how dare he come down here and, and the, why don't he go back to New York? I mean, there, uh, there was quite a bit of outrage and, you know, this sort of, um, like the very idea of him coming down here and trying to show us up and there's poor people in, in New York and um, so forth. And so, yeah, and then the governor made a horrible statement that's in there that said, I don't know what he's talking about, people starving, um, I hate to even quote it, but he's, there's a terrible quote in there that he said. Um, and uh, so, uh, a shocking quote. He said, most of, he said, uh, Negroes um, are so fat they shine. Most of the ones I know are so fat they shine. That's the governor's public statement on Kennedy's um, trip. That, so that tells you something. Um, so Stennis and... and um, Eastland, so they seized on this word starvation and took it to the like the most the extreme like what you would see in some of these people where people are actually like dying on the spot of starvation like when you see these famine pictures and that wasn't the case but that was quibbling because these children were very malnourished if you just eat a little bit of bread and syrup for lunch and bread and syrup for supper and that's all you get all day that counts as starving to me but in 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 Mississippi they were like oh nobody's starving and how did that's just like they said it was a um they always talked about Robert Kennedy's hair so they were like some kind of feather brained idea and his feathery hair head or some you know that's what they said in the newspaper and all of these things um so but interestingly enough they had a hearing they sent the doctors down had a hearing um in, in July and had the doctors testify and had pictures um, of what they had seen. And um, he, so, so they said, um, Stennis and Eastland were there and they were quoted, and Eastland was quoted as he smoked his cigar, um, saying, gross libel, gross libel in the New York Times that these people were hungry. But, and I quote, Kennedy just kept, like he was in those hearings in the 50s, and um, going after him, like, what do you think this picture shows? Have you seen children like this? What is, you know, look at these children. Look at this, what you see. And a little bit later, Stennis called his office and offered $10 million as emergency food aid amendment to a bill. And Peter Edelman, who fell in love with Marion Wright as they drove through the Delta. It was almost like for love at first sight, so there's that story. But Peter Edelman was just offended that Stennis would even call, that how dare he offer such a pittance. It wasn't enough. It, you know, it, he wasn't doing it publicly. It was behind the scenes. And um, Kennedy said, which is something different, he's like, no, we will take it. We will say it's not enough, but we will take it. It's something, we'll say thank you, and we will build on it. So whatever they had said did get through to Stennis a little bit, whether it was that he knew he was going to have to face uh, a mixed race uh, electorate of both races. Um, Maybe that's what it was. But um, Stennis did see, (laughs) he had this great line in that hearing. He's like, I just want to say that I've always been against hunger and disease. And and Kennedy says, well, Senator, we have you on record now saying that. Um, <laughs> so, so I don't know. I did, I, you know, I don't know what was going on Senator Stins had. So, anymore. Hey, Ellen. Hey, how are you? It's good to see you. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the local press coverage of this event? Oh, Who was yes. there? What, did any of this relate through the local? Um, it did, you know, um, 
uh, Greenville paper was hot in Carter the third by that time was running it and so they were a more progressive paper so they pretty much covered it straight and then Hodding was there for part of the time and he wrote a, an editorial saying you know we need to do better and these things need to be um, addressed and if they that's what they found we need to work on it but um, you know still kind of walking that line in the time times but uh, the Cleveland newspaper the editor there, longtime editor, Cliff Langford, and I hope nobody's his cousin, because in Mississippi you never, everywhere you say, when you start to say a name, you're going to find somebody who's related to him. Um, uh, but he came around the corner, and there's this great sort of dramatic scene. There's all these great scenes in the book, this dramatic moment where he comes around the corner and says, Senator Kenny, what basically what the hell do you think you're doing here? Um, he comes the corner around the corner of the shack there where the children are lined up and says, "Why don't you go exactly what you would? Ex why don't you go back to New York and if you're interested in poverty and fix it up there?" And Kenny says, "Well, I am working on it up there. What are you doing here?" Um, and but Kennedy, you know, um, he. Uh, he was, you know, the son, he was, he wasn't, he didn't back down, but he, wa he wasn't super confrontational, but he's just kind of stu stood up to him sort of toe to toe, and they had this conversation, and um, Langford says, there's nobody starving here, why are you coming to the worst part of town, and I'll take you to the nice part of town, you're just trying to make us look bad, and um, Kennedy he said, there's no one starving here, everybody can come, I have a standing offer, if people are hungry, they can come to my office and I'll feed them. And Kennedy said, well, step over here. I'll introduce you to some. Um, and he pointed to those children. He's like, if you don't know any starving people in your town, let me show you. Um, so Langford was, uh, you know, and he and he was, his um, response was virulent. I'm trying to think. Uh, and, of course, the Clarion Ledger was just, you know, outraged that anybody, just well, everything that you can ex expect. And it, if you look at the, the Clarion Ledger in those days and the Daily News, they were appalling, just utterly appalling. Um, and uh, the Clarksdale paper kind of, because they let Curtis, was, a, was covering a lot of civil rights, they pretty much let him cover it, the, you know, straight up. And I don't remember if they edit, addressed it editorially or not. They weren't, they, editorially they weren't progressive, but they didn't interfere too much with Curtis as he was covering the emergence civil rights movement. But, um, so, but, yes sir. Um, forgive me because I'm not sure, but I'm wondering why a Democratic summit senator would leave Washington DC to come to go to the Delta with no, with no um, agenda or, or, or good reason for going to the poorest part of the, uh, the poorest state. What was the reason for going to a place where there's 50, 60 percent unemployed, unemployment because agricultural workers are, are, are out of jobs because mechanization right. is taking over the agricultural industry. So, why did Ken Kennedy? Why did he come down here? Is that yeah, where? Well, the, you have to know that you know. Why, why, why oh, excuse the, me. What, sorry. Are the, what are the consequences? What did? What resulted from his visit? Oh, great. Those are both great questions. Well, the Kennedys really never had a thought in their head that wasn't political in some some sense or another. That was just kind of, and he had so. So, so I'm sure that he did the sort of political calculation a little bit, but you're right, he wasn't going to be picking up, it wasn't elector, I'm sorry, what? Oh, okay. Um, but it was really, he took his role as part of that committee very seriously, and the assignment for that committee was to look at how these poverty programs were working. And so they went to Mississippi, then they went to Eastern Kentucky in what were the poorest, some of the poorest parts, which um, was a different kind of Appalachian poor, um, poor whites, but uh, some similar problems in terms of the commodities and food stamps. So um, I think that, but you know, that's a good question. And I don't know exactly. I didn't find anything, a letter that said the reason I'm going to Mississippi is, um, which would have been nice, but I think that he, um, 
he, he felt like it was part of that. And, you know, Marion Wright was quite strong in the march before about how bad things were. And I don't know if he really believed her when she said it. And so he was a, an experiential learner. So he, he learned by experience. And um, I think that's why it had such an impact. And actually what happened afterwards is that's a whole, you know, that would be a whole other talk. I didn't really touch on that. But um, it's hard to draw a direct line to say because he came to Mississippi, this policy happened because that's not how the sausage is made legislatively. He did change the conversation for a while, which I think is important for us to think about today, from poverty, which is an abstract term and a moving target. And if we, draw, if we all drew a picture of poverty, we would probably come up with different ideas to hunger and hungry children. For him, it was, he said, he came out of that shack, he said to Cliff Langford, he said, this is an American problem. These are American children who are hungry, and we need to fix it as Americans, and we can't. Then later, he gave a speech about it and said, if we can't fix, if we can't feed our own children, if we can't feed American children, we can't live up to the promise that um, our founders, our nation had when it was founded 200 years ago. Um, we can't live up to those principles. So to him, he just, so the idea that uh, hunger, so there was a lot of coverage about hunger. There was a select committee that was formed after he died of, um, they changed some rules about the food stamps. Immediately there was, it took a year before emergency aid got to the Delta, um, but they did waive people who were too poor to buy them. They did waive some of those fees immediately. And then um, this committee that was formed in the Senate, the Select Committee on H Hunger, had people like Bob Dole on it and George McGovern chaired it. And there were quite a few things that came, were recommended that eventually became part of food aid policy. Um, so Far more to the story than we've been able to go into in the hour that we've had, but we do have copies of the book Delta Epiphany, $28 in the Mississippi Museum store just outside the doors here. Ellen would be glad to sign your copy. Help yes. me thank Ellen Meacham, and I hope we see you all thank back here Thank you all next so week. much. I love your attention.